thank you, Rabbi Lebhar, and I'm very happy to be here in a kollel for the first time. I've been in Toronto many times, but over here, first time, beautiful place. Bezrat Hashem will be very matzliach in Torah and spreading Torah and bringing new Jews in, always growing and going. As the rabbi just started uh, with his introduction to the situation about, you know, what's happening in the world, that will be the topic tonight at 7.30 in Eish Torah that I speak there. Last night we had a great full house, so it was beautiful. It was nice with questions and answers after the lectures. Hopefully today will be just as good or even better. So now we're going to speak about emuna, faith. And I know the first thing when a Jew hears about a speaker who comes to speak about emuna, he says, oh, I heard about it 500 times already. But my question to all these people who, th who think that way, you heard about it 500 times, but did you come 1% higher than your emuna from five years ago? That's the question. Question is, do you feel today that I'm a much higher level of emuna than was I was uh, five years ago, 10 years ago? Not always, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Most people, they go up, they go down, they go two steps up, three steps down, three steps up, two steps down, but somehow after 10 years, it seems that he's the same person. First day, first one, he was a Baal Tshuva, started to learn about Emuna. Ten years later, he's still fighting for money, still arguing, still cheating sometimes, all kinds of things that you ask yourself, after ten years of being Shomer Shabbos, what's going on here? Ten years, not, not one step forward? Let's clarify, first of all, what Emuna is. In Judaism, when the creator of the world gave us the Torah 3,330 years ago, did he ask us to believe in him or he asked us to know of him? What did he ask us to do? What does the Torah, when the Torah refer to a person, what does Hashem say to a Jew? Believe in me or you should know I'm your God. You should know I'm the only one. You should know I run the world. You should know there's no one but me. There was no one before and will never be one after. All the requirements are knowledge. One time in a Tanakh, one time, believe it or not, you have the word ta'aminuli, actually twice. One time it's an obligation to believe in Hashem. And the other time Hashem is asking, Abu Badavar Azen, Chema Aminimli? And this, after all of what I've done for you, you still don't believe in me? So it's really twice speaking about emunah. Everywhere else, speaking about yediyah. What's higher level, yediyah or emunah? In science, the word uh, believing, if, if you don't mind, uh, with the seeds. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so if you, if you, if you know that... Uh, the, in science, believing means not knowing. When a scientist say in his research, we believe that that will happen, or we believe that that's, this is gonna happen in one month, everybody understand, you believe, you believe, okay, maybe yes, maybe not, there's a doubt. The only time we will put our money on the stock is when they say we know for sure it will happen. We know knowledge and Elimuna is two different leagues. If you say, I know this is Sarah, you don't say, I believe this is Sarah. What do you mean? She's your sister. You don't know if she's Sarah or not. You know. You don't say, I believe. Like you say now, I know it's, not, it's day outside. You don't say, I believe it's day. I believe it's sunny. You either know or you don't know. Yeah. So knowledge is a much higher level. Knowledge is 100%. The, different, the distance between zero to 99.999%, right, is shorter than the distance between 99.9% .9 to 100%, if you know what I mean. To, to jump from zero level in Emunah to 99.9% will be much faster than to complete the last point, point 0.1% of Emunah and turn it into Yediyah. Emuna, you can elevate during the years, during the month, with certain things that you see and learn. To reach a level of Yediyah, that means it's 100%, it's very difficult. Now, what's the difference between Emuna and Yediyah when it comes to our life? Where the Yediyah end, really the Emuna begins. Let me explain to you what I mean. If, um, 
if you know that this person is the president of the bank, right, and you know he's in charge and he can sign checks and he can decide what you get, what you don't get, what the bank will give you, what it doesn't give you, you know 100%. Now he says something to you. Now it's up to you how many percent you want to believe in what he promised. You first have to know that he's the one who has the power. If you don't know that, how are you going to listen to him? Maybe he's fooling you, he's a con artist. First, you have to know that he's the boss. After you know he's the boss, here comes the emunah. Will he keep his promise to me or not? We'll see in a week. The more emunah you have in him, the more you're willing to take a chance. If, you're, if you don't know him yet, you just know that he's the president, but you don't know how reliable he is, and he asks you to put a million dollars in a bank, would you put? You're not so sure. But after 30 years of dealing with him every hour, every day, in business, back and forth, and you see what kind of... After 30 years, if he tells you there's a good investment, you trust him. So you develop the emunah with the years, with experience, with many cases in your life that shows you that I can rely on that uh, person. When it comes to Hashem, it's actually even better. Because first we have our relationship with Him throughout our life, so the older we get, the more experience we get with our own life. But we don't even have to check in our own life. We have history to prove to us what Hashem did. So in order for us to know that all the miracles that happen in the Torah really happen 100%. If we know 100%, it's not stories, it's really happened. What more questions we should have about our Creator? If after He performed in the Torah in a way that the Torah described, or splitting the ocean, bread is falling from heaven, the Egyptians are drowning, the clothes are growing with the people, they don't have to change anything, the shoes, diapers, none of these things. There's so many miracles that happened to them in 40 years and many other things, winning the war, occupying Israel, getting rid of seven empires, kicking them out of the land against all odds without an army. We didn't even have a professional army. Women, children, so many things that each one of them is against all odds. If everything really happened, then what's the question? I have to ask if he really runs the world or I have to trust him or not? What's the question? This is really what God comes to us and say in the Torah, after all what you saw, He's still asking me question. The Gemara says that when Hashem gave the Torah, He came to the Goim, and He offered each nation to join, not to get it instead of the Jews, like some think, to join the Jewish nation. A quick, instant conversion. I'm actually taking you and attaching you to the children of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. You want to accept my Torah, yes or no? So they made a vote. They went to make a vote. There was a king. Every nation had a king. And the people vote. Most of the people vote against the Torah. Because they didn't know what's in it. They didn't know. What, I'm going to sign on a document and say yes before I read the, con uh, the conditions? Let me read. Let me see what you want. Then I'll answer you. So they made a vote. The majority ruled against it. What happened to the minority? They wanted to accept it. So why they have to lose? Because most of the people in the country are stupid. The smart people has to suffer. That's democracy. You want it, you have to live with that. Democracy is a very foolish rule, if you understand what it means. Democracy means the majority of the people will decide for the minority what's right, what's wrong. The problem in life is that most of the people in the world are not so bright. It's many, you go to countries, you are certain countries in the Middle East, you have 100 million people, maybe a million of them know how to read and write and to communicate like human beings. The rest are all farmers with no education, no common sense, no nothing. So the majority is ruling for the doctors, for the engineers, for the judges, for the lawyer, for the scientists, what's going to happen in this country. So that's a very foolish law. However, people want democracy because it promotes human rights. But that's also foolish, because nothing promotes more human rights than the Torah. And the Torah does not promote democracy. There's no contradiction. You can have one leader, like Moshe Rabbeinu, and have perfect human rights. The question is, who is the leader? Saddam Hussein or Moshe Rabbeinu? That's the question. That's what it comes down to. And the Torah gave 
the condition who deserve, who is worthy to be a leader. Not just everyone who has money and, and power and, and, uh, and is a good warrior. No. There's a list of requirements. Humble, good personality, God nominate him, a prophet nominate him. There's a list of requirements. So going back to what we started, so the goyim, the minority of the goyim, the Zohar say, will be reincarnated again and will have the merit to convert. They won't lose. That's why we have so many converts in this generation. Every day, the Batei Din in the world, converting people, also here in Toronto. Why? Because all these goyim who see the truth, right away get inspired, they run, they do everything they can to convert. Why? Why one go yes and the other one no? The answer is, this is souls who wanted to join the, God, the nation of God, but because of the majority, they lost. So nobody lose. You deserve, you get your chance. That's, that's one thing. So the question is, so when the goyim say to Hashem, What's in it? That's the, that was the question. What's in it? Before we agree, Hashem say you won't accept the Torah. What's the problem? Why, why, why not? The answer is, the, an, the answer is, after all what you saw that I did to the Jewish nation, after taking them out of Egypt, after one year of miracles in Egypt, after all the things that happened, you still have the nerve to ask me what's in it? I don't want you in my nation. But it gets much worse. How many of you knew, really, one of the biggest questions in life is how come Passover is a holiday? Passover it should have been the biggest morning days in history, yeah. worse than the Holocaust day. If 80% of the Jews died in Egypt, that means 12 million minimum died. There's different opinions how many millions we had. According to the most lenient opinion, 12 million died. And why did they die? For one reason. This is our topic now. They didn't have emuna. What does it mean they didn't have emuna? They saw what happened in Egypt in the darkness, which is the ninth plague. So they already saw eight plagues already. It's enough. You don't need more than one or two. But you saw eight times what they did in Egypt for you. You see Moshe come, he say what's going to happen, it happened, amazing things, against all the laws of nature. And then I say to you, go out with me to the desert and I will take you to the promised land. And you say, no, we love Toronto, we love New York, we want to stay in our houses, we finally get our mansions back, our jewelry back, we get freedom, we get our green card back, now you want to take us to the desert? That's all they did. It's really, if you think about it, in our standard, can I say something? One second, no, not yet. Yeah. So in our standard, in our standards, it's really not a sin. If a person loves the materialistic lifestyle he lives in, in Canada, in America, in France, whatever, but he keeps mitzvot, he believes in God, he does chesed, he donates money to Israel, to yeshivot, all kinds of things, nobody's holding him as a bad person. The opposite is a great tzaddik, no? But here, the requirement was one. Trust me and go with me. And they said, no, we want to stay here. We finally released from the slavery. Leave us here. We'll, we'll follow you here. But don't take us now to the desert. We had enough. But they really suffered tremendously. They were suffering just until a month ago. They were working. They were beating them up. So finally, they can breathe. Now to go on a journey in the desert? So we don't want. And she says, oh, you don't want? I don't need you in the world with the Egyptians in Makat Choshech, all of them died. So what we, what we have to understand here, it's the level, the requirements level of Hashem from each one of us to what level of emunah we have to get. Let me give another example. Hashem said to the Jews, I'm giving you man every day. Don't say for tomorrow. Eat and enjoy the moment. What's gonna be tomorrow? The Gemara says, someone who has food to eat today and ask, what are we going to eat tomorrow? Uktan emuna. He doesn't have emuna in Hashem. And any one of us can raise his hand and say, I'm not worried what I'm going to eat tomorrow. If you only have food for your children between now and tonight, that's it. But for tomorrow breakfast, you don't have what to eat. Can you sleep at night? If you know tomorrow the children will come, 10 children will come, you have to bring them eggs, bread, uh, cheese, something to take to yeshiva to school, and you know by tonight when you go to sleep, 
the fridge is empty, nothing is, you don't have money, nothing to go to the grocery. What person can sleep at night? I tell you who. Avraham Avinu, Hashem told him, after 99 years, I gave you a son. Tomorrow, I want you to take him and kill him. And the Torah says, He went to sleep. How can it be? After 99 years, you finally had a boy. Hashem promised you, this boy will inherit you, will continue your descendants. All of a sudden, he changed his plan, supposedly. It's all a test. And he said, tomorrow you're going to kill him. How did he fall asleep? And what father can go to sleep when after 99 years he has to take his only son and kill him? Even for Hashem. Fine, okay, I do what you tell me. I'm not going to go against you. But can you sleep at night? And not only that, why you get up so early in the morning to take him? Take him at 7 in the evening. Enjoy the day with him. It's my last day with your son. 500 kisses, bringing all the relatives, the friend. You know, come, give us a bracha before you leave us. Itzhak. No? What is this? 5.30 in the morning, he runs to kill him. This is a munah. That's why Avraham is in a Tanakh, and when we die, nobody will remember who we are. Why? Because he, he was a real believer. And this is a legacy for each one of us, how to be. If we be 1% of Avraham, believe me, it's a very high level in this generation. The problem is we probably don't even reach that 1% level. So all the people who left man for tomorrow, it all became warm. So what did they gain? They went to work extra hours to collect the man. And the people who believed in Hashem, they didn't have to bother. They were sitting, eating, enjoying, beautiful. The ones who went and worked extra, in the end, nothing left in their hand. And they got punished for that. Besides the worm. The worm is besides the point. And still, you violated my instructions. So that means you're a sinner. So they lost from all directions. They lost from their pleasure. They lost from their saving. And in the end, they got punished. This is what happened to a person that is a non-believer. All his life is struggling and suffering because of his stupidity. His stupidity destroys his life. All the depression, all the panic attack, all the anxiety attack, all the suffering, all the extra work, all the fighting, all the battling in courts, all come from one poison, lack of emuna. A person improves his emuna by 1%. Half of the suffering of his life is gone in a minute. Another percent, almost nothing to worry about. Did you ever see a monkey with gray hair? <laughs> no. They don't worry about the mortgage. <laughs> he lives, he has something to worry about. What does he worry about? He worry about the surgery? He needs a plastic surgery, something, that. Children, how will I marry my children? People worry about things that in nothing, it's not in their hands. People worry about things that right now they think it's bad, but there's no guarantee it's bad. It could be the best thing. You get fired from a job. Who says it's a bad job? Maybe tomorrow the FBI come and arrest everyone. How do you know that it's bad what ha just happened to you? You know how many hundreds of times people got fired from a bad job? And I mean, they thought it's great, but they got fired. And three months later, I met them and said, wow, I'm making triple now. And I have such much better job. So without getting fired, they'll never find a new job. So something that we cry for now could actually be the best thing that can happen to us in our life. So we cry for nothing. Chazal say, from the destruction of the temple, the second temple, all the gates in heaven are locked. We live in a, everything is blocked, except one gate. Sha'are dim'a lo ninalu. The gate of tears did not get locked. Always open, which means a Jew full of sins. Technically, if he prays quietly to Hashem, Hashem doesn't accept his prayer. Why? Wow, so many sins. You coming to talk to me, you're full of sins. But if he cries, he goes express directly. So, so the question is, if it's called Sha'are Dim'a, Lonin alu ever, they never got luck. Why you call it sha'ar? Sha'ar means a gate, something that you lock and open every day or every week. Open, close, open, close, it's a gate. If it's always open, it's an entrance. It's not a gate. Gate is something that sometimes closed. If it's always open, why you call it a gate? That's the question. The answer is, it depends who the person is. 
For some people it always open, for some people it sometimes close. How, how, how do we know? The answer is, depend what you're crying for. If you use valuable tears for nonsense, when you finally come to cry for something real, sometimes the gate may be closed for you. That's why it's called a gate. But if you only keep your tears for the real things, then it's always express open for you. You come anytime. What is it like? Your king is your friend for whatever reason. You did him a favor. So now he gave you a special pass. You can come anytime you want without an appointment, break into my office and tell me what you need. Great thing, no? But if you came three, four times and ask him for nonsense, my fish is not delicious enough. Can you maybe help me to get better fish for breakfast? Can you help me to make my car a little bit shinier? So the king said, this guy is a moron. <laughs> Wasting my time. I gave him a pass. He comes to me to cry for his stupidity. You know what? Make sure next time he comes, lock the gate for him. He'll show you the car, tell him the king doesn't want to see you. That's exactly what happened. The person get up. Hashem, crying. What happened? My daughter fell in college. What college? How do you know maybe college will destroy their life? Why are you crying for it? Uh, Hashem, what happened? Uh, my son didn't make it to the football team. Hashem said, very good. I helped him not to get accepted to the football team. Why, well, you want him to be Mechalel Shabbat next year? Saving his life. How many people went into sport and had destroyed their religion? So we cry for such foolish things. Oh, Hashem, my car is not six cylinder, only four. Why? It makes noise when I drive. Ah, you're crying for such foolish things? Tomorrow when you need to cry for life and death, I have a problem with you. Your tears are too cheap. It goes for nonsense. This is the problem here. So that's why it's called Sha'arei Dim'ah. Now, there is one rule in the Torah. The more your emunah becomes stronger, the easier it is to get what you need. This is the rule. If your level of emina is very low, you have to do a lot of ishtadlut. You have to do efforts. Every person has to do some efforts. How much effort is depend on how much emunah you have. Let me give you an example what I mean. How do we know? How do we know that we have to do any efforts? The answer is the Torah says, Hashem will bless everything you do. You do, and then I'll bless you. But how much you do, the Torah never said. The opposite. The Torah says, work is a curse that Adam got for his sin. If you can avoid the curse from your life, of course, don't run after the curse. Run after the blessing. Run after Torah, run after things like this. What are you running after work? Work, it's a punishment. It's a curse. If there is a way for you to manage with less work, and you still have what to eat and to, and to, to get dressed or whatever, why are you killing yourself? Why you have $100 million and you still run on, on, on business meeting when you're 65 years old? How long are you going to run after money? You have enough to live 500 years straight now just from the interest of your money. And you know how many thousands of Jews like this there is in the world? They already walk with their cane, they help them to get out of the car, and they go to a business meeting. Seven, eight in the morning, at night. Don't enjoy the children, grandchildren, nothing in their life. Their desire for money and for nonsense drove them crazy. So all their life went for nothing. They don't have, and they still worry. He has so much money, and he's still worried what's going to happen in the business all the time. They're always under stress. They go, speak to the psychiatrist or psychologist. They tell you how much they suffer. And the other way, a person that hardly has a job, make a living, sometimes he's more confident in his future than this one who has already enough to live 500 years. So it's a matter of working on it. Just like when you develop muscles in a gym, it's a process and you start for very, you know, very light and then heavier and heavier, and then you build your muscle. You build your emuna. The only problem with muscles, if you walk one year and you now have a nice muscle, that's it, you have the muscle. Once in a while you have to maintain it a little bit, but that's it. You don't have to kill yourself every day like before. But emuna, it's not like this. Emuna, you can be 30 years working on your emuna every day, every day, lecture, reading, working. You see how much Hashem is doing for you? I'm very sorry. 
That's my Canadian. Uh, I don't even know how to. Okay. So, yeah. So the question is, the the third years of Emuna, third years, and you reach already a level of Moshe Rabbeinu. One week you stop practicing, it goes down to 50. Another week to 20. Another month you're already back to 2%. This is what the difference between emunah and everything else. Money, you work, 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 you save, that's it, you have the money, you put it in a safe, it's there. Don't have to work again to maintain this money, it's there. Your jewelry, your car, whatever you gain, you gain. Of course, you can always lose it, but naturally speaking, it's, it's there. You got it, it's yours. Emunah will never stay by you. It's not something that you gain and that's it, it's yours. <coughs> Knowledge, yes. To know God runs the world, you don't need. One hour of proofs, you watch my film, Torah and Science, you know already, for the rest of your life. It won't go out. Once I prove to you Hashem exists, I don't have to remind you in 10 years. You already know, it's a fact. Same thing, you found out your father after 20 years, you didn't know who your father is. Once you know you have a father and you met him, I don't have to come 10 years later and remind you, you know you have a father. You already know it, that's it. You don't have to practice remembering that I have a father. You know it's over. That's why I always tell people, sometimes in a lecture you say something and the person didn't know it, and now he knows it, and he rebels against you. He gets, he gets angry that you told him the truth. It happens in lectures. So they get angry. So most of the speakers get paranoid when someone gets angry and fight with them and argue with them. I am very happy with this, because <coughs> I know finally I made a change in this person's system. Up to now, he was living peacefully in his lie. Now somebody shaked him up, so the lie and his situation bothers him very much. Actually, the ones who yell have a bigger chance to change for good than the one who sit peacefully and just listen and go home to smile and drink wine. <laughs> the ones who argue, that means it kills them. It kills them. Not necessarily they'll change, but there is a chance because now it kills them inside. That's a very good sign. Everyone see it, clapping, beautiful jokes, nice, this, fine, what do we get from here? So the idea is to shake the person up to wake up. But once the person found the truth, it tried to make him forget, it's not going to work. It's in your head already. Now you know what Mechal El Shabbos is in the eyes of God. You say, I wish I wouldn't come to the lecture. Okay, so you live in illusion. Now you came, you know the truth, that's it, you cannot erase it from your head. Once you know something, it's yours. But emuna, not the same. Emuna is the Satan is doing everything he can to make you lower and lower in your emuna. And how does he do it? He shows you what the rabbi just spoke about. Someone shot, killed people, this, in yeshiva, all kinds of, they put a bomb in a synagogue, all kinds of things that we hear, Holocaust, uh, cancer epidemic, all kinds of things that gives us enough doubts to think, what's going on? Where is Hashem? Where is Hashem? Same thing, the way of a person is to focus on the negative, not on the positive. Person had a diary that he write all the little miracles that Hashem does for him every day. And then the big miracles, and the ashgacha, and how many things it happens to a person. One time when he has weak emunah, he reads this diary, so oh, wow, I'm so embarrassed, Hashem, please forgive me. How did I have doubts in you? After 5,000 miracles you make for me every week, I have questions if you're going to feed me, not feed me. I'm embarrassed. What well, we tend to forget. But let me explain something, how the concept of emunah works. I said before that if you elevate your level of emunah, everything that you need will come much easier for you. When your emunah is very small, you can work 10 hours a day. Hashem puts 90, 95% in your hands. 5% He helps you. But if you show him that you trust him, you're dependable on him. Hashem, I'm depending on you. I'm a total loser. I don't know anything. I'm not talented. I don't know anything. Everything I do know, it's come from you anyway. So here, I'm your son. You have the money. You have the power. Help me out. Just like a beggar who comes to ask for donation. So, okay, you're counting on me? I'll help you. If a person says, no, kochi v'otsem yadi asali tachayil I'm okay. You know, you know this joke. One person was looking for parking. And he said, Hashem, I promise you, if you find me now parking, I have an emergency meeting. If you find me in the next two minutes parking, I'm going to start putting tefillin every day. <laughs> then after a second, somebody came out. He said, no, it's okay, I managed. 
I managed by myself. <laughs> That's kochi ve'otzem yadi. I managed. You know? So this is what happened. It's happened to all of us. We pray, pray for something. Once we got it, right, we say, oh, it's nature, ma. It happened one way or the other. He forgot how much he begged for it. Once he gets it, who's to say Hashem gave it to me? Maybe it's my efforts and my being a nudni, calling every day to get the job. How do I know it's from Hashem? This is the way the person is. Once he gets it, he begins to say, well, how do I know? Can I prove? It's not guarantee. I didn't really mean it. This is the way we are. So let me explain one thing here. Sometimes people make a big mistake between emuna and laziness. What's the connection? Let me explain. Sometimes people say, the mother come to her boy, is let's see, 19, 20 years old. Get out of bed. What are you doing all day? You're not doing, you're not working, you're not doing something with your life. Get up already. Why? What? Prepare your future. You have to get married one day, you have to buy a house, something, go, find a job, do something. Why? Why should I work? I trust Hashem. <laughs> That's laziness. <laughs> That's not trust in Hashem. That's 100% laziness. And he put his laziness with the cover of Emunah, I'm a believer. Tomorrow when this person has a problem, not only is not a believer, he behaves like a lion. He's ready to kill someone, stole five, men, five dollars from him. Well, Moshe, what happened? I'm going to kill this guy. What? He stole five dollars from me. Ah, we thought you have a munah that Hashem runs the world, so why do you worry so much about money? After all, he's not such a great believer, but it's very easy to have an answer when your mother comes and says, get up, you're eating here, you're doing nothing, you might as well do something. No, no, I have a munah, why? Hashem feed the whole world, don't you see? So he's going to feed me. If you are in a level like this of emuna in Hashem, then of course, Hashem will feed you, don't worry about it. But Hashem didn't say that you have to be in bed all day and have emuna in Him and He's going to feed you. No. If you don't learn, go to work. If you want to learn, better than work. I'll help you, don't worry. You still learn Torah, I still give you what to eat. All the people who learn Torah in the world eventually eat. All of them, nobody starves to death. Yes, they're not very wealthy, most of them, but to live, they have enough. We all asking Hashem to give us what we want, not, not what we need. That's another problem. We all asking specific things. I want a five million dollar in Beverly Hills. <laughs> five million dollar. Why my sister had? Why can't I have? So that's what you. Who is to say it's good for you? Maybe it's horrible if you live in such a house. You won't have time for Hashem. All kinds of things. So the point is that a person has to pray, never for specific things. Never, because you don't know if it's good or bad. Even when you're sure that this will save your life, don't pray for it. Just pray, Hashem, I'm begging you to help me to get what I need to be closer to you. That's the only permitted prayers that allowed. Never for anything specific. This Itzik wants to marry Racheli, so he, he likes her beauty, so he prays, Hashem, Racheli, Racheli, three months, four months, crying. Rach Shem said, okay, no, what do I have a choice? Take her. One year later, what happened? Wow, you don't know what she did to me. Wow, this, that. <laughs> Why are you praying for something that's not yours? You don't know if it's yours. Just pray for kosher, kosher, tzadeket, wife. You want pretty? Pray for pretty, no problem. But don't pray for specific. You don't know. You're not Hashem. Hashem knows what's for you good, and, what, and you don't know what's good for you. We don't know what's good for us. We only guess. Since we don't know, we can never sign a personal guarantee, this is good for me, this is for sure bad for me. We don't know. That's why you have to say, Hashem, help me to be closer to you. So what do I need now? You know. Now I'm broke. Not, not one dollar in my pocket. What's going to make me closer to you? To stay broke for a year or two? That I'm beginning to cry and fear for my life and the future of my children? Or that you're going to give me five million dollars in the lottery? And I become so grateful to you, so I leave work, I go to yeshiva, I become a rabbi, I, my, I send my children to the best yeshivot. Some people made a lot of money and it helped them spiritually very much. Some people, it destroyed them. So everyone behaved different according to his choice. So since you know me better, you know who you're dealing with. 
So tell me what's really good. Help me to get what is really good for me, but remember the purpose, to get closer to you. Closer to you. Most people, they get much closer to Hashem when they receive suffering. Yes. So suffering is a good thing or a bad thing? Depends for who. For the majority of the people in the world, is the greatest thing you can ask for. Because if that's the only glue that connects you to, to Hashem, there's nothing else. Every time you make money, you're happy, this, right away, you don't have time, kosher, glad kosher, you go Vegas, vacation, Miami, on the boat, on the beach. What happened? Ah, oh, you know, business is booming. Oh, business is collapsing, puts back his yamaka, his beard, come to the shul, seven o'clock, rabbi, give me bracha, business is bad, oh, oh, begins to pray. So what's better, to make money or to lose? Better he stay without a dollar. It's the only way it connects him to Hashem. Because remember, the purpose is not to be here 70 years. This is earning a ticket for eternity. The eternity would look according to who you are. What do you think? Why are we say in Hebrew, when a person passed away, lo alenu, what do we put on the sign? Alach le'olamo. Did you ever think, what does it mean, alach le'olamo? Alach le'olam aba. What does it mean, alach le'olamo? Like his own. Every person has his own world. What do you think? It's collective, collective reward and collective punishment? No. Every person gets precisely what he deserves, for good and for bad. Precisely. You can learn with the same guy, 20 years, Chevruta. He was the one who got up to bring the books every time you need another book. That's the difference. He gets much bigger reward in, in learning than you. Because it's something extra. Or you say, what? We learn the same thing. For Torah, he gets more? Yes, he made a little bit more efforts. It's already not the same. You know, there's a very famous story. The Gaon Mivilna lived 250 years ago, and he, in his generation, there was the Magid Miduvna, which was the best speaker in the world. When he came to speak, like, it was full stadium. Don't have, and remember, there's no internet, no Facebook, no sending emails and bringing hundreds of people. There was no communication. So he had to go from word to mouth, literally. And, but it's all, it was all enough that they put one note somewhere in town. The Magid Miduvna will be here next week. The place is packed, because he was a very, very, very interesting speaker. Besides, he was a very righteous man. So the Magaon Mivilna hired him to be his policeman. So I'm giving you a salary to watch over me. So he said to him, you don't need to pay me. I'll tell you what you need to do. He said, no, no. If I don't pay you, then sometimes you feel not comfortable telling me the truth. You're not obligated. Why should you tell me the truth in my face? And now when I pay you, you must tell me, otherwise you're a thief. And I know you're not going to be a thief, because I'm hiring you for that purpose. You must tell me the truth in my face. Don't worry. I will appreciate the truth. Today, when someone tells us something wrong about us, instead of saying, you're right, I have to wake up and, get, and change, what everyone does. What? Who are you? Who are you to tell me? You see that? Chutzpah, this guy is. Who do you think you are? Putting people down. I don't like this approach. What's going on here? I don't like this putting people down. I have it. I see it all the time. <laughs> the right approach is, we appreciate, thank you very much for telling us what the Torah says. You're right. We're not good enough. We have to improve. What's the problem? What's the ego? What's this pride? Where is it going to get you? Nowhere. Say, you're right. I'm not learning enough. You're right. I'm not modest enough. You're right. My wig is too long and flashy. Maybe it's time to change to something more modest. You're right. Maybe I'm eating like a pig. You're right. Maybe I'm a liar. You're right. Maybe I'm lazy. You're right. Maybe I'm not a good husband. You're right. Maybe I'm not helping enough. There's millions of things. And all of that we write. Because we're not perfect. Someone who accepts criticism, knowing a person is really meaning well, not someone who, who comes to put you down, really, like a jealous friend. That's a different story. Someone really means well. Even the truth hurts. You have to say, well, the truth is the truth. <coughs> I got, over the years, thousands of thousands, many thousands of emails. And people say, I'm not, God forbid, saying it to break. I just want you to get the point. They said, you are the only speaker we were able to hear, the only one. And there are many speakers who have much more knowledge than me. Don't get the point wrong. So why is it? Because you say it as it is. 
fine. That's what we want. We don't want making it pretty, nice, this. Oh, you're good. It's enough. You do this. It's better than nothing. This kind of approach, telling the person you're good, would leave him in this situation until the day he dies. He won't bring him up. And when he dies, he's going to hate that rabbi for eternity. Wow. I was in your synagogue for 30 years, and you never told me that I'm a, I'm a crook. You never told me that my wife is not modest. I didn't even know. I did, and even if I knew, in my, in my subconscious, I never dream how severe is our sin that she dressed like this, or that we talk like this, or that we do this and this and that. It was in your hand to tell me, hey, come, take me to the side in a nice way. Listen, look what the Torah say, look what the Rambam writes. And then it's up to me to say, I want to do it or I don't want to do it. Sometimes we hear the truth, all of us, with no exception, and we still take our chances. It happens to almost every person. There are two kinds of evil inclination. There's evil inclination, external and eternal. What's the difference? Sometimes a person with his emunah, because he doesn't have emunah, he makes sins. But once his emunah go higher, he stops right away to make the sins. But there are certain sins that even if a person has a very high level of emunah, he still cannot stop doing it. It's very difficult for him. For instance, smoking cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes is a sin from the Torah. It's not allowed, because the Torah says you must, must watch your health, and everybody agrees today that it's destroyed life. So the Torah says that no person is allowed to do anything to damage his body even by a little bit. No, we're not allowed. If we don't know that it's damaging, there's no guarantee. For instance, eating fat meat, it's also not healthy, not necessarily. Some people, it's very healthy for them, depend who you are. There are certain kinds of food may be healthy for me, may be poison for him. So therefore, it's hard to know. So it's still open to debate. But cigarettes, it's bad for everyone. Drugs, bad for everyone. It, it destroyed the brain of every user. It destroyed his life, it destroyed his marriage, it destroyed his children, it destroyed gambling. It's bad for everyone. It's not, oh, for this guy it's good. Even the one who makes money in gambling is bad for him. It's, very, it's a poison. So there are certain things we know for sure. So a person that knows Hashem exists, he's learning Mara all day. He knows Torah, he's Baal Tzedakah, he works on himself very well, mamash tzaddik, but he can't stop smoking, why? It's not because he has question if it's allowed or not. No, he knows he's doing something wrong. But the desire, the addiction is so strong, is, 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 not, is not strong enough to overcome his desires. But it's not only cigarettes, it can be ego, it can be jealousy, it can be uh, you know, all kinds of things. It's very difficult. This kind of scenes are nothing to do with your level of emunah. You have very strong emunah. This, the people who smoke cigarettes, what do you think? They don't know it kills them? Of course they know, but they still cannot stop. People who take drugs or drink alcohol, they don't know it's bad for them? Of course they know it's bad. They're not even denying it. But they, it's very difficult for them to stop. People who make scenes with the women, they know it's a horrible scene, but they are so strong into this desire. So somebody from the outside has to move him to a different environment. Come to yeshiva, six months, leave your environment, learn. The power of the Torah give you the spiritual strength to fight against your desires, your nature. There's no way to change your nature without Torah. If, you don't, if you're not connected to Torah, it's very difficult to stop being proud. Very difficult, because everything in your life is around your beauty and your money and your clothing. All of a sudden, take it away from you, life is very bitter. A girl, all day she's proud about her body, her things on the street, all of a sudden tell you have to be religious and you cannot show it anymore. She said, what do I live for? Better to die. Because that was her whole life, 17, 20, 30 years of her life. This is everything around her life was around her, her look. And now you took it away from her. She gets very upset. She says, you know what? If this is religion, I'd rather die. How can she do it with the power of the Torah and the lectures? Without it, it's very difficult. Also, generosity. Someone who's naturally stingy. How he become generous? What do you think? You change the nature of a person? The answer is you train him. You say to him, first you teach him a lot about the power of tzedakah and how much he gained. So you show him that tzedakah is not giving, it's taking, it's a great investment. The stingy people, they still make investments. 
when they write the check, $50,000, and they, and they buy stock, they only do it because they know it's going to become four times more in a, in a month from now. Mm -hmm. so, but, it's, but when they write the check, it's also giving. So why they're not killing themselves? If he has to give $50,000 Zdaka to the yeshiva, he's like, oh, that's it. He's going to go in, get in coma. <laughs> 20 years, he won't come out of coma. Moshe, what happened? I, I don't know, something happened. I owed $50,000. I, I don't forgive myself. But when he write $50,000 uh, investment, it's perfectly fine. He goes back to business. Because it's not giving, it's taking. So you have to show them according to the Torah. By giving, you're actually sending it wire to your life of eternity. That's one thing. But it's still not enough. The Torah say, Achare peulot nimshachim alevavot. After the actions follows the hearts. Most people think, I want to be religious, let me see what I love. What I like, I'll do. What I don't like, leave me alone for now. Hashem said the opposite. You have to first do and get used to it. Then you'll love it. This is something that people do not understand in the psychology of the human mind. A person fall in love with something that he get used to. So if in the first time when you did this mitzvah, you felt horrible, wow, what am I doing? How is it possible I agree to do such a thing? It kills me. I don't know. I don't want to leave. Ah. Next time, he suffer 99%. Next time, 98 After 50 times, only 30 40%. After five years, what's your favorite mitzvah? This. How? Oh. That's it. That's the way it is. Hashem made us. It's like a robot program. The more you do it, the better it works. Today, you have in a computer, if you put one time an address, then next time when you put two or three letters, oh, it comes out already. Once it's in the system, it's already working. That's it. You don't have to put efforts and suffering into it. For good and for bad. Also, sins. That a person makes the sin for the first time, he feels horrible. Oh, why did I do such a thing? I'm so ashamed, I'm so embarrassed. Then it happened a week later. Now he's only suffering 95%. After a year, he already proved to you that what he does is kosher and it's mitzvah. It's mitzvah now. That's what it is. What, what do you mean mitzvah? A year ago, you told me you're dying from doing it. Now already he fell in love with that. He already convinced himself he's doing something great for humanity. You understand? This is called ergel ofech leteva. Uh, habits turn into nature. And the only way to reverse nature to the positive side is only with the Torah. I always say Torah is an, a spiritual antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you about a story about emuna in our generation. In our generation, listen good. There was a person named Rabbi Todros. That's his name. Todros. Rabbi Todros, he was a very big tzaddik. <laughs> and he was very poor also. Very poor. But he had very high level of emunah in Hashem. Very high level. One time he heard that some Hasidim in Yerushalayim are demonstrating against cars who drive on Shabbat. They lay on the road, the police came, they arrested them, they put them in a car. And they put them on Friday, Friday afternoon, they put them in arrest. So he heard that Jews who care about Shabbat are going to spend Shabbat in jail. He didn't leave him alone he's in his mind that I'm going to sit home and eat and they're going to be in jail for doing the right thing, screaming about the holiness of Shabbat. So he decided to release them. So he ran to the police station, but he doesn't have a penny. He's very poor. You see how he, he dressed? Horrible. So he comes to the police. He says, how much do you need to release them on bail? He says, $1,000 in dollars. We're talking to you more than 35 years ago, this story. So he said, OK. He ran to the yeshiva. He had a friend. His name was Benaya Shmueli. Today is one of the biggest rabbis in Mekubalim in Israel. But at that time, he was Benaya, the teenager, 20 years old, whatever. So he came to his friend. He said to him, I need to raise $1,000 from all the people in yeshiva. Write everyone how much he gave you, and I am guaranteed to return everything back. It's my responsibility. So he told him, who, who has money here? It's all yeshiva bachurim. Well, they're going to have money. I said, don't worry. Take 50, 10, 20, write down, collect 1,000. I come back later. I'll pick it up from you. So they, everyone contributed. They write. OK, it's not donation. It's a loan. 
So everyone wrote, how much you're gonna get next week, okay. So he went to the police, he releases them. He released all of them. Then on Sunday morning, he comes to Venayahu, he said to him, listen, I want you to go with me today to Meron. I want to make a special meal for the poor people in Meron to thank Hashem that for the first time in my life I had the merit to do mitzvat pidyon shvuim, to release a prisoner from the hands of the prison. So since I've, I'm very excited and I finally made this mitzvah, Pidyon Shvuim, it's such an important mitzvah that if you don't have money, you're allowed to sell the Sefer Torah, the only Sefer Torah in a city, to release a Jew from the hands of the Goim or from the prison. But not a Jew that is a rapist. He mitzvah that he'll die in jail. Yeah. Not a Jew that is a murderer. You release him that he will kill other Jews. Or not a con artist that went from one person to another and stole their money. And say, his wife crying, my husband is in jail, help us. It's mitzvah pidyon shvuim. No, no, your husband should be in jail forever. <laughs> Why, taking him out of jail is hurting my brother, my sister, my cousin. What, their blood is not as red as his? It's better he's gonna be there and we're all gonna be safe. But a Jew that whatever, for instance, uh, tax problems, didn't pay enough taxes to the government. He didn't hurt anyone personally, whatever, they made a mistake, he cheated, whatever he did, we have an opportunity to get him out of jail, that's mitzvah. Person, uh, I don't know, went into an accident, accident, mistake, whatever, he did something wrong, so they put him in jail for a month, whatever, you can release him, very good. So there are, there are ways that it's a big mitzvah. So he felt very good that he made this mitzvah, especially for these people who demonstrate for Shabbat. So he said to him, how are we gonna get now to Meron? And where do you have money to make Sauda? We, we broke, we don't have money, no, no money. But he was in such a high level of emunah that he lived moment to moment. He trusted Hashem 100% everything he needs, amazing. So he told him, I don't understand why you always worry. We have to do what we need to do, and the rest is not in our hand. We don't have an obligation to succeed. We have an obligation to do our best. The rest is not in our hand. What are you disappointed? You didn't save the whole world. Hashem has his plan. You did your best, you can relax. You didn't do your best, you worry. That's true. But you did your best, what, what can I do? So I want to now do a mitzvah. I want to make food for the poor people and say thank you to Hashem in public. So that odaya. You coming with me, yes or no? So he said, okay. Well, how are we going to get there? He told him with a special taxi. <laughs> taxi from Yerushalayim to Meron. You know how much money it is? <laughs> Maybe $200, lefachot, minimum, in Israel. And this was many years ago. So he told him, taxi from here to Meron? And he said, yeah, what, do you want to waste all day and going from one bus to another? We get there at night. We want to go in and out. Go there, do it, come back. We were able to go back to learn today. He said, but you have money for the cab? He said, oh, again, you worry? <laughs> Just get in the cab. So the driver came. Listen to this story. This story happened. Rabbi Nayao Shmueli is a very respectable rabbi. He said that story. Now when he is 60 something years old, a few years ago he told that story. So he said to him, get in the cab. So they go on the way to Tzfat. There's no food, no money in their pockets, nothing. And the driver is driving. So then he said to the driver, pull over over here. There's a kosher, glad kosher restaurant. I'm going to get the chickens, the rice, all the food. <laughs> <laughs> so the driver pulls over. He comes inside. He said to him, I want chickens, I want this rice, I want this, salads, bread, whatever. So he looks at him, the way he dressed, the owner of the restaurant. He said, Mazal Tov, what, yeah, the boy, something, breed, something. He said, no. So what is the occasion? So he said to him, what happened on Friday, and now he wants to thank Hashem for what happened. So the owner of the restaurant is a wealthy man. He was clever, he saw how it looked. So he said to him, can I be also part of your mitzvah and help you out? No charge. <laughs> he gives them all the thing. Now he said, where is your car? <laughs> it's outside. So he helps him into the car. So he comes out, he sees a taxi special, <laughs> and I was sitting in the, car, in the cab. <laughs> so he said, you came from where? He said, from Yerushalayim? You came with a special taxi? Wow. Even I don't take a taxi from Yerushalayim. <laughs> So he said, he say, wow, this is, he, he was a good man, so his heart didn't let him leave him like this. So he asked the driver, how much is all the way from here to the side? 
Whatever the price was, he took out money. He said, here, this is for the ride. Wow. He paid him. So now they go over there. They get to Tzfat, to Meron. Not to Tzfat, to Meron. <laughs> it's 10 minutes before Tzfat. So he got to Meron, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai grave. The cab arrives. They're beginning to take the food out, this table over there. So they start to put, all of a sudden, they see the Baba Sali is sitting over there with about 30 wealthy Moroccan from France. They're all sitting in a beautiful Seuda, meals, machia, drinking, singing. As soon as they came out of the cab, the Baba Sali and Ruach HaKodesh, he looked at him, he called him, he said like this, come here, come. So he comes towards the Baba Sali. One of the Moroccan gave the Baba Sali an envelope. The Baba Sali took the envelope. This is after he called him. Listen what's happening here. This is a level of emunah that Hashem wanted us to have, but we're very far from it. So the Baba Sali called him. As he walked towards the Baba Sali, someone handed him the envelope. The Baba Sali doesn't even look. He said, this is for you. He gives him the envelope. Ben Nayao stand next to him. He said, this is for you. He gives him the envelope. He said, I went to the side. <laughs> I didn't want to open it in the front. I opened it up. Ten hundred dollar bill, a thousand dollars, exactly what he collected. Thousand dollars, he gave it to him. Oh. Understand what the level of a of a muna? A hundred percent. And now, now you're thinking something like this can happen once in fifty years, no? So let me tell you something else. Something that happened to me. I came home. Well, this story is about three, four months ago, maybe five months ago. I'm not so good with measuring times. So I come home around noon. I see my wife is holding a telephone and a credit card. I know, I know, in most houses, the husband is used to it. He comes home, the wife is with a credit card nonstop. It's like her earrings, <laughs> you know? So what happened is, I see my wife has a credit card. I know my wife doesn't order things from the, from the telephone. So I ask her, what are you buying? She said, we ran out of checks, so we need to reorder checks. So okay, how many checks are you buying? She said, it's very expensive. They want $82 for 360 checks. I said, what? It's almost a quarter a check. What is this, uh, gold? It's only a piece of paper. It doesn't make sense. I told her, wait, wait, don't order it yet. Let me check. I come to the computer, I put in Google, printing checks. <laughs> you know how many thousands of telephone numbers and websites came out? Almost every person in America print checks. Everyone has computer and printer, you send them a void check, you send you a package and you charge you for the PayPal. That's how people make money, students. So I see thousands of pages full of numbers. So what am I gonna do to save 30, 40 bucks? I'm gonna waste my whole day now. Start comparing numbers, I say, Hashem, let me pick up one. <laughs> so I see one, back, I clicked on it. It came, all kinds of samples. I see 600 checks, 30 something dollars. Much, a quarter of a price from before. That's good enough. Let me order it. I see an 800 number, I call the number, an American guy picks up the phone. He says, for sales, press one. I click one. <laughs> so he picks up the phone, hello, can I help you? I say, yeah, I want to order this check, 600 for 30 something dollars. Tell me, is that include shipping? He said, no, not include shipping. I said, oh, here is the catch. Probably he's gonna tell me now $30 shipping. So I said to him, how much is the shipping? <laughs> the shipping? <laughs> so he said to me, depend to where. <laughs> So far, everything legit. So I said to him, Monsi, New York. So he said, where in Monsi? So my red light went up. I said, oh, that's probably a con, con artist or something. I'm going to give him my address. He visit me tonight in the middle of the night. So I said, you know what? Let me not give him the exact address. I'll tell him the corner. What's the difference? He's going to be able to tell me the shipping charges. So I told him, high view corner of Nelson. So he said to me, oh, no charge. Just come tonight to Rabbi Schlesinger Shur at 8.30 and I'll bring you the box. <laughs> Next to my house, there's a shul. Every night, there's a lecture. The rabbi there is an Ashkenazi rabbi. He gives a lecture every night from 8.30 to 10. I say, oh, you come to Rabbi Schlesinger Shur? He say, every night. I say, I say, you live in Monsi? He said, yes. Now remember, it's 400 million people in America. <laughs> And I picked him up from thousands of thousands of possibilities. By the way, the story didn't begin yet. <laughs> 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 so
So I say to him, you live in Mansi? He say, yes. I say, where in Mansi? He say to me, Bates Drive. I say, Bates Drive? I used to live in Bates Drive. <laughs> I say, what number? <laughs> in the building where I lived, he lived. <laughs> next door to my house. Oh, wow. The next day we went and picked up the box with the checks from his daughter, right where we lived. So now, 400 million people. <laughs> thousands of telephone numbers. Hashem, what do you think? Hashem wanted to save me 30 bucks. That was the next year. Come on. The next wasn't this. Hashem gives us a lot more than $30 here and there. We live with a miracle. It was to wake us up to see who runs the world. I'll tell you something even greater than this. One time I called Citibank. It used to be the biggest bank in the world at that time. So I called up. I said to the guy, I don't understand. I gave someone a check, and the check bounced, and I have the money in the account. What's going on? He checked. He said, you're right. I don't understand what happened. Maybe the signature or something. I said, no, it's the same signature. He said, sir, I see everything you write. Let me go and check. After 20 minutes explaining this, Ameri this American customer service guy what, what I need, I need a letter of apology to send it to the person, so after all that, yeah. So yeah. So, 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 so lesson good. We're almost finishing. So uh, I, after all that, after 20 minutes being on the phone explaining the guy, the phone got disconnected. <laughs> I say, wow! Now to start all over from the beginning. So I say, you know what? What do I have? I have a choice. I got to take care of the problem. So I call them back again. And a guy picks up the phone. And I say, sir, I was just with customer service. And uh, I explained to him that I gave a check. The money was there. I don't know whatever reason the check bounced. And I need a... So the guy on the other line that picked up the phone started to scream, sir, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> sir, it's me. Do you know what just happened here? The guy is telling me. Do you know how many customer service we have all over the United States? More than 30,000, and it's hundreds of buildings with operators. There is a central unit that every call someone makes, it decides to what state to send it. So the chance that it will come to the same customer service, one call after the other, does not exist. Came to the same one. Why Hashem showed me? So big deal, I spent another 20 minutes. Not the end of the world. All of us has things like this. To wake us up, what do you think? I run the world. Don't ever forget that. So the conclusion of this lecture, let's conclude. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. The conclusion is, it's very, very important to elevate the level of emunah to make our life much easier to prevent suffering, to prevent being worried all the time, to prevent all kinds of sicknesses that comes because of, as results of being worried all the time. The more we elevate our level of emunah, the less efforts we will have to do in this field. Remember, akol bide shamayim, chutz mirat shamayim. Overall, how much money you make in your life, it's already predetermined for you before you came to the world. If to be righteous or wicked, it's 100% in your hand. So parnasah, shiduch, all kinds of things that we have, you always have to remember that it's Hashem. That's why a person has to talk to Hashem all the time. Help me, help me to get close to you. I need this. If it's good for me, get it for me. Always remember, if it's good for me, please get it for me. Because sometimes you ask for something that's not good for you. Help me, help me, help me. A person that bang a nail to the wall, he takes it for granted. Say a few words to Hashem, help me not to break my finger now. <laughs> How many people try and they broke their finger, with the, they missed the, the, the nail? What do you think? Th things that are very simple. Help me to do it. Help me to catch the bus. Help me to catch the plane. Ah, I, I, ca I, I catch the plane 100 times a year. I'm already used to this. My, it's not a miracle. No, no. Don't take it for granted. Every minute we are alive, it's a miracle. Look what's happening in this world out there. Everything, we th you know how many billions of miracles happen every week in our, in our system, in our body? 
You know how many miracles? You have no idea how many miracles. So we take it for granted. Don't take anything for granted. One tiny movement inside your system. You know the, brain, the, the blood who goes into the brain, the brain is the size of an apple. 10 trillion connections. Each one of them get milli, milli, milli liter of drops of blood that goes in those veins. You ever saw a brain of a cow and a butcher? Look at these little lines inside. Blood goes all the way in such a complicated way. One extra drop. Put your finger like this in a glass of blood. Go like this and put one drop. One blood, it will, it will be clogged. One little drop like this, and the person is in coma like Ariel Sharon, five, six years. That's what happened to him. Little pressure in one side of the brain. That's it, cannot move. So you see how many miracles happen every second? Well, you take it for granted. And the most important thing, always remember, if Hashem feed the bugs, the mosquitoes, the elephants, and the Indians who bow down to their idols, he won't feed me that he called me, I'm his children, I'm, you are my children, I love you from all the nation, I did, I did this for you and this and this. He feed the one who bowed down to his Buddha, but he won't give us what to eat, so why are we worry so much? So if you don't have enough what to eat, don't worry, it's a part of the plan. That's what it has to be right now. It's, Hashem doesn't have limitations, he wants to send you as much as he wants. People think the more money you make, it's a sign that Hashem loves you more. No. no. Saddam Hussein had 40 billion dollars. Arafat, 40 billion. Gaddafi, 200 billion. Uh, all of them had hundreds of or billions of dollars. Ma. So what is it, an indication that Hashem loves you? No. The opposite. If a person has too much money, he has to worry. Maybe Hashem is paying me in my lifetime, God forbid. Why? The Torah says in the last three verses in Parashat Vaitchanan, read it, go, Parashat Vaitchanan, last three psukim. When I'm tired of a person, of his behaving and he's uh, not keeping mitzvot or whatever, I pay his reward in this life, cash, to get rid of him, to destroy him. So what reward? If a person is a sinner, what reward? Every sinner makes some mitzvot, few mitzvot he makes. Right? Here he puts tefillin in his bar mitzvah. That's a big mitzvah? Yeah. He gives tzedakah here and there for people who knock on his door. So it's a big mitzvah. One time in his life he heard kiddush. Maybe he fast once here on Yom Kippur. Even secular people do few mitzvot. So how am Hashem is going to pay them if they don't have a share to the world to come? How is going to pay them? He must pay them here. Another Lexis, another house, another store, another dream, first class, good food. Five maids in the house, no problem, take. I owe you for this, for this, take. But then you come in front of me, you say, where is all my mitzvot? What, it's gone? No. You got an extra house, what do you think? Extra two million dollar, extra house for the summer? What do you think? You got a phone. You got a phone, what, you take it for granted? You have five phones, right? Jewelry, there are diamonds, all kinds of things. I paid you for everything you wanted. That was your dream, no? Your dream was the watches, the gold, the vacation, the extra house, the first class, the sushi. That was your dream. I paid you. What do you want? I gave you what you value the most. Now you are empty. Okay, questions. Few minutes for questions. Yes. I'm wondering, like, you have me one second before you start. I have free CDs for you. They're free. Because people coming to me say they don't have money. And they are free. Free so CDs, suitcase full of CDs. Don't leave without taking a few CDs, please. Tonight at 7.30 at Tonight, 7.30, a different topic, completely. 7.30. Aisha Torah in Torn Hills. Uh, yeah, what's the question? What's the question? I'm sorry, there's no. I'm saying you have a desire, a hope, uh, something strong in your emuna, and you are doing everything to get close to Hashem. Abal, you want your family members to get close to Hashem. Right. I do milut. You do milut. Not everything is in your hand. No. You do everything in Hashem to make that. 
I got the question. The more you pray and do, it can give them more chances to become Baalei Tshuva, but no one will do the job for them. If they don't pass the test that Hashem put for them, that's their problem, not yours. If every person could make another person become religious just because he's righteous, and he wants all the people he knows to be righteous, those people won't deserve any reward. Why they deserve reward? If I do hocus pocus and I made him Shomer Shabbat, what reward is he supposed to get? He doesn't supposed to get any reward. Let's say you, you give them all the arachim and you brought them up in the way... Not always. Yitzchak gave Esav the best values and Esav, you know who he was. Okay. Not always is in your stop? hand. Huh? Where do I you stop? never stop. As long like, as you breathe, I'm you pray. I'm crying, I'm doing everything. That's, it. That's all you want. That's but all you have to do. do I feel that I'm not upsetting Hashem? No, no. First, first of all, let, shh. you never stop. As long as you're alive, you pray for your children, for the husband, for relative, brother, sister, everyone you can. And even if none of them became more religious, it's not your problem. You will get rewarded for every minute and every one of your tears. Sometimes, let me explain to you something. Thanks to all your prayers, they come back again in a life, in reincarnation, and they now have a much bigger opportunity to become religious. You didn't see it, you'll see it later. And thanks to your prayers that Hashem gave your children another chance, not here, in another 20 years after, or 50 years, whatever it is, they come back in a new baby body, and now they're born in Yerushalayim, or in Bnei Brak, to a rabbi. And they see Torah, and they have a bigger chance, thanks to all your efforts. Every one of your prayers will be answered eventually. Nothing goes to a waste. More questions, yeah. I, I'm going back to the Yeshiyah uh, Try to keep it quiet. Those who have to leave can leave. I'm not offended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But please, the text, see this before. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. The night before they take a lamb, a lamb that's considered the god of the Four Egyptians. nights before they Four prepare before. it. Yeah. And they take, they risk their lives because it's supposed to be the god. So wasn't it a proof of an extreme amount of emuna? Because well, you claim that, like I've always learned that because of that emuna, they actually slaughter the lamb. So, and then you say that 12 million died, I just... Uh, first of all, you have to know one thing. Imagine today, Hashem comes to us and say, you live in uh, Canada or in the United States. I want you all to go to Israel next week. But before you go to Israel, in a week, the last week that you're here in Canada or in, in New York, I want you to take all the crosses from all the church, put them in the middle of Toronto, and burn it. <laughs> in front of all the, rabbi, the, the, priest, the priests, the Christians, and, and take to the mosque, take whatever they have over there, and burn it in front of all the Muslims. One Jew would have the nerve to do such thing? No. If Hashem told us, not the rabbi, Hashem came to us and said, this is what I want you to do, trust me, I will protect you. Some of us will be brave enough, most of us will hide. So Hashem came to them to say to do that to them, to that to them. They tied, they tied the, go, the sheep to the bed. So the Egyptians asked, why you took our gods, that was their gods, and tie it to your bed? What are you going to do with that? They already smell something bad is about to come. So the Jews had to answer, we're going to slaughter it, burn it, and eat it. So they went crazy. It's like you tell an Indian today in India that you're going to eat their cow. <laughs> Know what's going to happen if you, tell, if you go to India and they, the cow passed on the street and everyone bowed down to the cow and you come with a knife, shh, slaughter it, they, they do a riot in you. Wow, you killed our God. Uh, they go crazy. So yes, you're right, it's a very big level of emuna. But, but, oh, but, but, shh, but let me explain to you why. When I see my neighbor put the lamb, the goat, tied to his bed and nothing happened to him, and my cousin, and my other neighbor, and my friend, and everything is fine, I also become brave. Hey, look, nothing happened. But to go to the unknown, to leave Egypt and go to the desert, who knows what's going to happen? You need a certain level of emuna. Thank you very much. Hope to see you tonight. Thank you very much.